When we think about the options of finding close technosignatures in the solar system, what typically comes to mind are active ones. In other words, von Neumann, Benford, or Bracewell probes sitting in the solar system, presumably capable of self-repair or even self-replication, that we might someday find, or it may someday contact us. But there are problems with those ideas, in that it would take very advanced technology and effort to create a machine that can make a copy of itself on this scale. With a standard von Neumann probe, you need the resources, presumably mined from an asteroid. This would mean that before you even get to building a copy, you'd need to mine and process the materials. So your probe needs to be a fully equipped mining facility, above and beyond its intended purpose. Then it has to be a factory to create the copy. Then it has to be a programmer to set the new probe up, and so on. A von Neumann probe would need to wear many hats. The act of self-repair is somewhat more straightforward, but still requires many of these same steps. So the idea of interstellar probes of any flavor involves very advanced technology, which aliens may well have. But it may be that it's just too hard to make something like that work long term. SETI itself went through this stage. The original idea for searching for alien radio signals by Coconi and Morrison envisioned gigantic beacons screaming the presence of an alien civilization. We have not seen this after decades of SETI. And there may be a good reason why. It's energy expensive to blast out a strong signal in all directions, and no one may think that this is worth it. We certainly have no plans to build one ourselves. Rather more subtle means seem more likely. There are a number of these, such as a directional radio transmission aimed at exoplanets that seems suitable for life and civilizations. But it's also been pointed out that there may be even easier and more straightforward beacons possible that use no radio at all. Perhaps, rather, the stars provide the radiation. These are the famous Arnold Louvers, giant baffles that block the light of the star they orbit in a characteristic way that alerts anyone that can see them that there is a civilization there. This, of course, was once on the table for Tabby Star, which was showing very dramatic dips in brightness, and one of those dips looked like an isosceles triangle, and thus briefly very unnatural. But it was also an exercise in being careful, because dust and comets can mimic that, which is what appears to have happened at that star. Interestingly, however, if one key measurement had gone a different way, namely the measurement of wavelengths of light passing through whatever it was, had it shown itself to be solid objects with no light passing through, then that would have been it, a bona fide technosignature. But it came back consistent with dust, though that story isn't over, and whatever that dust is, it's in some bizarre juxtaposition around that star that still isn't clear. So in short, SETI at a distance can look for giant mylar baffles as technosignatures. But back to the solar system. Instead of expensive self-replicating probes, might there be a simpler way for an alien civilization to have left its mark had anyone ever passed through? The answer is twofold. The first is yes, in the form of abandoned technology. This would be defunct equipment of some type that no longer functions and was simply abandoned in the solar system. This type of technosignature can be envisioned in several ways. An example would be mining equipment used in the distant past to harvest materials from an asteroid. This asteroid would appear strangely devoid of certain materials in comparison to other asteroids. But you might even find abandoned technology on its surface. An alternative would be the surface of the moon. No systematic search of the surface of the moon for buried technosignatures has ever been done, but there are plans given the enormous amount of data we have from lunar observations. This is not the case for some of the other bodies in the solar system that have active surfaces. You might find such equipment on the moon, but if there's anything at Europa, it's been ground to dust or sunk to the bottom of the subsurface ocean. Abandoned technology is just as good of a technosignature as a radio signal, but can last far longer. It's conceivable that a technological object in the solar system can last billions of years. But then there is the idea of intentionally placed passive objects as a cheap method of sending out SETI signaling. In fact, it may be the cheapest, most efficient way, and it's almost foolproof compared to the complexity of a functioning von Neumann probe, and it's a relatively new concept in the world of envisioning technosignatures. It's called a corner reflector, and we already make these kinds of objects. 
All it is is a mirror of sorts, something that reflects any radiation directed to it exactly back to where the signal was sent. Some variations of this on interstellar scales has been envisioned, such as in Carl Sagan's Contact, when the 1936 Olympics opening was broadcast back to us. This actually was not realistic, because the broadcast was closed circuit and not seen outside of Berlin. The idea would have been an alien civilization, however, rebroadcasting our signals back to us. In the case of a corner reflector, however, it would need to be close. Humans use these objects already. Corner reflectors were set up on the moon, so that laser signals can, and still are, bounced off the moon to measure precise distances and other experiments. They're also used in other areas, such as at sea and in radar. They're called corner reflectors because they are literally shaped like the corner of a room. And the cost is almost nothing to make. You could construct one easily out of sheet metal. Any alien civilization that once passed through may have positioned these kinds of reflectors anywhere in the solar system. Should Earth ever develop a civilization that can find them, which it did. And there are advantages. They work for most wavelengths, those smaller than the reflector itself. So the aliens get an advantage there, in that the frequency doesn't matter, as it does when looking for radio signals in space, where you're randomly guessing the frequencies, or looking in known areas for signposts, such as the hydrogen line. Another advantage is the corner reflector will very precisely replay the signal bounced off it, with a delay caused by the distance traveled, and it requires no power or maintenance, in that it's just a passive reflector. Interestingly, it's also very easy to search for these. Just create a suitable signal, send it out, and see if it comes back in a weaker form. If it does so, and you can repeat and verify it, then it essentially has to be an object of alien origin. There could even be several, or many such reflectors, deployed in the solar system. Where it gets harder, however, is doing so for the entire sky. That would be difficult. But certain areas could be searched where such a reflector may be more obvious such as an orbit of the moon, or orbiting with an axis point pointed in the direction of a signpost astronomical object, such as the closest star system or the center of the galaxy. On the other hand, the reflector might provide information in that its axis could be placed in the exact direction of the alien's home star system without the need for any kind of message that may or may not be decipherable. But it also might contain that as a message or a series of objects indicative of the alien civilization's culture as some sort of time capsule. It could contain useful or at least recognizable technology, the alien's genetic code, or even analogs of the Voyager record and Pioneer plaque, but from an alien civilization to us. So yet a new techno signature to potentially look for. But in this case, there are some odd instances. In the past, there have been mistaken false positives in detecting something like this accidentally that were, as it turns out, human spacecraft. One was the detection of a human-made solar wind monitoring satellite that classed it as a near-Earth asteroid, when in fact it was a piece of technology that the researchers were unaware of. It was the opposite of a false positive, rather a false negative, and remained that way until the object moved and changed its radar profile which ruled out an asteroid because a propulsion system was required for that effect. But it wasn't aliens, it was us. Another instance was the detection of a highly reflective object rotating and moving in a strange way. It was briefly on the table for a near-Earth technosignature because it was actually accelerating in its movement, the same sort of thing that happened with Oumuamua. Acceleration with no apparent means that doesn't fit with asteroids. It was a spent rocket stage that the researchers were unaware of, and the acceleration was due to it being pushed by the solar wind and acting as a light sail. But strangest of all remains unexplained. In 1927, an amateur radio operator in Norway detected signals that he was sending out, returning to him as an echo several seconds later. Echoes in radio are common. The ionosphere can reflect them or duct them around the Earth, but it's radio. It's moving at the speed of light so you need some real atmospheric gymnastics to keep a signal bouncing around, circumnavigating the globe numerous times to provide that delayed of an echo. Radio can circle the Earth about seven times a second, so eight or nine second delays is a stretch because the atmosphere is in constant motion and conditions change rapidly. 
These are called long delayed echoes and are anything with a delay of 2.7 seconds or more. Often these echoes are compounded. You hear a normal rapid echo due to the ionosphere, followed by a weak long delayed echo seconds later. Weirdly, however, the long echoes can't be predicted. They happen occasionally, but can't really be reliably studied because they're very transient, unlike normal radio echoes. These are probably natural, and it's most likely that the atmosphere can do things we don't really expect it to do. It could also be a reflection off something in the solar system. Distant plasma clouds emitted by the sun has been floated. Also aurora activity after solar storms, reflections off the moon, and even hoaxing, though that's hard to envision as early as 1927. You'd have had to know not just a hoax, but exactly when to hoax when someone was listening. And since there were multiple observations, that seems unlikely, and the phenomenon is real, if very transient. But what it might also be consistent with is a reflector or rebroadcast of alien origin. We just don't know. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently making videos again after a short hiatus of several days to take a break and read a book. In this case, a reread of a vintage copy of a classic, The Other Side of the Sky by Arthur C. Clarke. I never got to meet Isaac Asimov back in the day, and Heinlein was gone by the time I dove into the sci-fi convention world. But I did get to correspond with Arthur Clarke, and one thing I remember was he told me I should put my wacky ideas to work and try to write sci-fi. And I took his advice. Though it took me 15 years, procrastination truly is one of my strong points. Anyway, be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.